for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I, want to, I want to invite you to take your Bibles this morning and join me in 1 John. That's right, 1 John. A little sideways move on you there. You're all reaching for Romans. And yes, we are still doing our walk through the book of Romans. But today, what we are doing is we are kind of picking up part two of this whole concept of Abraham and the obedience of faith. So Abraham is the perfect example uh, that Paul pulls out to show us what true faith looks like, what the obedience of faith is. I don't know if you remember or not, but the Apostle Paul said at both the beginning of the book of Romans and the end of the book of Romans that his mission as a, a missionary on behalf of Jesus Christ was to bring the obedience of faith to the nations. And so Abraham displays for us what the obedience of faith even looks like. So last week, as we considered Abraham part one, uh, we saw this truth concerning him. So in Romans 4, verses 1 through 25, we realize that Abraham was justified. That's the word Paul uses. Abraham was justified, i.e. being declared righteous before God, by faith alone. And all God's people said, yes, yes. Dear ones, this is the most concise and yet fullest statement as to what the message of the gospel is. It comes from Romans chapter 3, verses 24, 22, 23, 24, and 25. If you ever write in your Bibles, circle this and write the word gospel alongside it. And it is this. The righteousness of God, that which makes us able to be right with God, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And all God's people said, amen. Why? Because, it goes on to say, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our condition. But when we come to Jesus by faith, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. That is an assuaging, satisfying sacrifice by his blood on the cross to be received by faith. So if you want a, a concise yet full statement on, as to what the message of the gospel is, it is right there. Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through, 22 through 25. And so the righteousness of God that's required for a right relationship with him is found solely in Jesus Christ and faith alone in him. And again... Um, we put this statement up last week. I put it up the week before, and I'll keep probably putting it up because it says it so well. Uh, to be made right with God is by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, according to the scriptures alone, all to the glory of God alone. So this is what we dealt with last week. Um, Abraham part one, the obedience of faith. And so Paul reached back 2,000 years before the cross of Jesus Christ and said this is the only way anyone has ever been made right with God. It was by faith in ultimately Jesus Christ. And Abraham proves that. However, <clears throat> this is one side of what we would call the complete story of what faith really is. It is obedience of faith. And so today, Abraham part two we are going to see that in the book of James, which uh, Barry read for us just a few moments ago, James uses the same word justified. 
But there it means not to be declared righteous before God, but to be vindicated before the eyes of men. And this is by obedience. This is by obedience. Now, just before I bring those verses up and we talk through them, I'd like to pray for us. So if you wouldn't mind just bowing your head with me for a moment, let's just step into the presence of God. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is the truth. Uh, We certainly live in a day of falsehood and half-truths and outright lies. But we know your word is true and that it is forever settled in heaven. And so, Lord, we never have to question the reality of the truth of your word. And today you're going to speak forthrightly to us through this man, Abraham. Uh, He is a remarkable picture of what true biblical faith is. And I ask that you would open our understanding so that we can assess even our own hearts and minds in light of what true biblical faith is. So grant us your grace, I pray, in this, I ask. Amen. Amen. Uh, If you wouldn't mind just pushing that door to in a second. Thank you. Perfect. Lovely. All right. So James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. I'm going to display the verses here so that I can kind of talk my way through them. I asked you to turn to 1 John. We're actually going to go there by way of application uh, off this this, uh, talk. Um, But so um, James chapter 2 and uh, verses 14 uh, through verse 24. So here we go. So this is what James goes on to say. What good is it, my brothers? So he's speaking to believers. If someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that kind of faith save him, is the question. Now, before we go any further, James is writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, and they have been scattered through persecution. And so there's a lot of hardship, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering going on. And James is challenging the church to be the church. So he will go on to say this in verse 15. If you find a brother or a sister who is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, simply go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needful for the body, What good or what benefit is that? Either for them, you didn't meet any real practical needs, or for you, what good is that? So verse 17 is is kind of his contention. So, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. It is dead. Now, he goes on to raise up an objector. You know, it's funny how Paul does that often in the book of Romans. James does that here. And so the objector is verse 18. But somebody will say, that's great, James. You have faith and I have works. As though you can separate the two. That's fine. You got faith, good for you. Got works, good for them. As though that they can be independent and stand alone. But James goes on to say this. Oh no, show me your faith apart from your works. So right now, James is saying, tapping his toe, he's saying, okay, okay, you say you have faith, prove it. Well, I I went forward in a church service. I I can hear you, but I can't see you. I I, I gave my hand to the pastor. He said I was saved. I hear you, but I, I, I can't see you. Uh, You say you have faith. Yeah, I I got baptized. Uh, I hear you, but I don't see it. In other words, he's challenging them. You say you have faith. Prove it. Prove the reality of your faith. You see, show me your faith apart from your works. But what I want you to know is I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. Now, this is a famous statement from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. This is known as the great Shema portion for the Jewish nation. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You believe that. You even recite it. You've got excellent theology. But notice what he goes on to say. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe this, and they have an emotional experience about it. They shudder. So good for you. You know the truth. But that still doesn't mean anything unless it filters down into shoe leather. Verse 20, do you want to be shown, and here he set them up, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Verse 21, and here comes Father Abraham. You see, this is the other part of the idea of the obedience of faith. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. Now he's referring to Genesis chapter 22 here. Was not Abraham our father justified? Here the idea is to be vindicated by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, and this is exactly the same portion that Paul used to say that Abraham believed God without works and was declared righteous. Verse 23, the scripture says, Abraham believed God, Genesis 15 and verse 6, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, is his, he's kind of resting his case. You see that a person is justified, vindicated by works and not by faith alone. Oy. <laughs> so we have spent a fair bit of time with the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans belaboring the fact that the only way anyone's ever made right with God, justified in God's sight, is by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. And now James comes along and he's saying, no, 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 no. Unless your faith actually goes on to prove itself in works, you don't even have true faith. And so, so back in, in the 1500s, uh, the German monk, Martin Luther, said that the book of James that we have in front of us here, the book of James is a right strawry epistle because he felt as though it was worthy of being burned. He didn't really like the book of James because he felt as though it contended against justification by faith alone. And a lot of people have it in their minds that, you know, here's Paul, faith alone and Christ alone, and here's, here's James. No, no, it has to have works. No, no. As though they're duking it out with each other. Paul was the missionary to the Gentiles. James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. It's almost as if they had come to loggerheads. It's as if they were fighting each other. That's how many people view this. Now, uh, about 15 years ago, I preached through the book of James. Uh, when I preached through the book of James uh, many years ago, uh, I actually created a little video of what this could be taken as. So bear with me. It's really corny and it's really bad, but I hope it makes the point. So here we go. Uh, look, Master, it says they have a 9, 11, and 6 o'clock service. Hmm, very impressive. Hmm, let's go. Huh. Uh, good day. Welcome to our fellowship hall. What brings you here? Hmm? My name is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Perhaps you have heard of me. I understand that you teach that to be right with God, one must work his way to heaven. Come on, my friend. I teach that one's faith in Jesus, if it is a truth faith, it is a faith that works. I would think that you would agree with that, would you not? Ah, James, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. I wrote that you know. Ah. Paul, you seem to have gotten that all wrong. Faith that is by itself, if it does not have any works, is dead. I said dead. Enough! I have had enough of your heresy. No, please, hear me out. 
But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Do you not know this? I ask you, do you not know this? Come on. Do not patronize me. Wait. No, no. Salvation comes by faith through grace alone and not of works. It is your faith that is useless, my friend. And it is your faith that shall die. Uh, 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 want some of this? Uh, uh, check that out. Uh, hey, oh, yeah, oh, good one. All right. Uh, nice moves. Uh, check but my out. moves are better. Huh. Uh, How about this? Uh, Everybody uh, join. Uh, Visitors, stand up. Say hello. Oh, hey, Thank you. Come again. Uh, uh, whoa. Uh, good thing I have HMO. Uh, oh. Uh, hey, oh. Uh, you're very limber. I know. Uh, oh, my uh, crack. Surely we can find a compromise. Help me up. Quick, watch, watch it. Oh, ask you. Uh, there is no compromise. So sorry, that was a little too corny. Uh, but, but the point being is this is how people visualize Paul and James. They're, they're going at each other contending for faith. But really, if we're to understand what the writers of Scripture are saying, is they're not fighting one another. It's not like they're toe-to-toe fighting each other. They're actually back-to-back fighting in opposite directions things that would, would defame true faith. And so on the one hand, the Apostle Paul is defending true faith, that which makes one right with God called justification by faith, contending that any attempt to add human works, deeds, or efforts to the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross is damnable. Read Galatians chapter 1 sometime. He's saying this is not true faith. The moment you add anything to the finished, perfect work of the Son of God, you don't have faith. So on the one hand, Paul is fighting for justification by faith alone in Christ alone. But on the other hand, James is defending true faith that evidences that one has truly been made right with God. As Paul was fighting for justification, James is fighting for sanctification, contending that if your faith in Jesus Christ does not change and transform your everyday life in very practical ways, it's not true. It is not a saving faith. So they're not fighting each other. They're both fighting for the faith. The obedience of faith. And so even the Apostle Paul will make this statement. Um, He is here quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 where he says this. The righteous one shall live by faith. And the way one becomes righteous is by faith. And when you become righteous, you now are to live a life of faith. It, it, It is ongoing. It doesn't stop. It begins with justification, but it goes on to be a life of sanctification. John Calvin, uh, the famous uh, theologian, uh, put it this way, and I think he puts it very, very well. It is therefore faith alone which justifies or makes one right before God. And yet that the faith which justifies is not alone. It always leads to a life of active obedience. So you cannot divorce the two. And sometimes it's too easy, particularly in evangelical Christian circles, to say, faith alone in Christ alone, you're going to heaven. Congratulations. Woohoo! To, but forgetting. But the other part of that now is a life of obedience, following Jesus Christ by faith. You see, true faith is to believe the gospel. Amen? Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 25. Believe the good news. Now bend your knee, repent, bend your knee, confess Jesus Christ as Lord, and get up and follow him. That's the obedience of faith. And that's what Paul and James together clarify for us to understand what it means to be truly saved. One of the undeniable truths of scripture is this. If our faith in Christ is real, it will show up in the reality of everyday life. If our faith is a true faith, it truly transforms our hearts, our minds, and our lives. If it is a saving faith, it will go on to shape every area of our lives. This is simply the reality of much of the scripture. In fact, uh, let me share with you just a few of the truths from various authors of Scripture. So we've already seen the Apostle James. The Apostle James has told us that true faith, and there he focuses on the practical acts of service. 
showing the reality of one's true faith, a faith that does not make one get involved in the life and needs of others, especially believers who are suffering, it is a dead faith. That's what he says. In other words, if there's ever a time for the reality of your faith to come to bear, it's when your brothers and sisters need you. And if it doesn't bring you to action, then you really need to question, what do I have? Do I simply have good theology? Or does it actually change my heart and motivate my life? This is James' contention. Again, the Apostle Paul, and we'll look at much more as we make our way through the book of Romans, but Paul likes to focus on the transformation of character. The transformation of character. The root of true faith will express itself in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, according to the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These things will be manifest in our lives if the Spirit of God truly indwells us. And, you know, the Apostle Paul warned the Corinthian church where these things were not evident. And he says this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? In other words, if there's not a reality of Christ in your life, you don't have saving faith is his contention there. In fact, in Romans, he will warn the Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So, so there goes with the good news, believe, receive, also, bend the knee, confess him as Lord, and follow him with your life. And, and if those things aren't coming together, demons believe, and they shudder, but they're not saved. And so what it's saying is that we are to have this thing called the obedience of faith. So, so for James, that was practical acts of service in a time of need. For the Apostle Paul, it's a transformation of our character. The Apostle Peter focuses on, on adding virtues to our faith. Uh, Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, that we are to make our calling and our election sure because we have been made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. If that's true of you, this is what James uh, Paul, Peter says, um, add uh, to faith, add virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, steadfastness. And to steadfastness, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, love. Love. True faith is always growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who aren't growing, according to Peter, have either forgotten the gospel or they don't have true and living faith. James, practical acts of service in times of need. Paul, character transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, continually be growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews, here's another one. He focuses on running the historic race of faith. An entire chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, is dedicated, dedicated to, to show us that Old Testament believers that without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then the writer goes on to share the exploits all by obedient faith before God. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, he says this, now that you have been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those who have gone on before you, let us, Lay aside every weight of sin that clings so closely. Let us run the race with endurance that's set before us. Let us look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. In other words, his point is this. It's our turn. 
It's our turn. They've run their race. They ran it well. They finished their course. Now it's our turn. Take the baton of faith and run in obedience. Follow Christ. Do, do things for God. So every writer of the New Testament expresses this idea of the obedience of faith. James, practical acts of service. Paul, character transformation. Peter, adding virtues. The writer of Hebrews, running the historic race of faith. So no matter the author in the New Testament, they all say the same thing. That there is a correspondence in reality in my experience that will back up my claim to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, if you have truly met the living God of the universe, you will of necessity have, it'll ha have an effect on your life and on your living. Think of it like this. I try to think of an illustration that maybe can kind of hit this home. Let's say somebody has an appointment with you. And let's say it was uh, 10 o'clock this morning. And uh, you were hanging out waiting for them. And 10 came and 10 went. 10, 15 came. 10, 15 went. 10, 30 came. 10, 30 went. And just about 11, the person that you were supposed to have the appointment with at 10 steps in. And he's like, I'm sorry I'm late. This is what happened. I was driving to get here because this appointment is so important to me. I was driving to get here and my car broke down. And, and, and I was trying to get here and I thought, well, my car's broken down. So what I'll do is I'll run to get to this appointment. And so I, I left my car beside the road and I, I kind of ran alongside of the road. And as I was running along, I got hit by a dump truck. Sorry, I'm late. And you're looking at them. And there's no scars, there's no broken bones, there's no blood. And, and you're thinking, yeah, you didn't get it by any dump truck. Liar. That's, that's going through our minds, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, that's, that's a fanciful story. It's not true. And yet to claim that we have met the God of the universe and our lives remain unchanged, how can that ever be true? How can that ever be true? And so this is the challenge. I didn't want to just pick up Abraham and, and run to the next phase of justified by faith alone in Christ alone. It's true. But sometimes we can just recline into the idea that I believe, I believe, I believe, without understanding that it now moves into life and obedience. And so really... Uh, Abraham does a beautiful job of showing us both aspects of justified before God and justified or vindicated before man. So, we've looked at James, we've looked at Paul, we've looked at Peter, we've looked at the writer of Hebrews. Let's take a brief moment and consider together what the Apostle John has to say. You're in, I pray, uh, the book of 1 John. Now, I love John and his writings um, because John focuses on a little different aspect. Um, so, again, um, James on practical acts of service, Paul on character transformation, Peter on adding virtues, the writer of Hebrews on running the historic race of faith. But what John focuses on is being born again. Being born again. And so in John 3 and verse 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so what John puts his finger on here is the true and saving faith is actually a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit in a life, imparting to them a new birth or literally to be born from above and being now made a child of the living God. So John 1.12, but to all who received him, Jesus, and believed in his name, he has given the right to become the children of God. But he goes on to say this, who were born not of blood, it's not of human generation, nor of the will of flesh, it's not up to you, nor of the will of man. Try as you may. You cannot be born again. But it's of God. So he's saying that this, this new life, this life of faith, is actually a supernatural act of God in the imparting of a brand new 
life. If you think back to the garden, Genesis chapter 2, God, it says, uh, formed man out of the earth, out of the dust of the ground. And so, if you will, you can imagine Adam as a statue. God formed a man out of the ground, and he is a statue. Then the Bible says that God breathed. The word breath in Hebrew and in Greek can mean to breathe, or it can mean spirit, or it can mean wind. It's, it's the same word for any of those. So God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Well, of course, Genesis, or Genesis chapter 3 happens, and we've fallen from grace. We are now born dead in this world, and the only way we can ever become alive spiritually is for the breath of God to be blown into our hearts and lives through the Holy Spirit. And we now become a living spiritual being. It is an act of God. It is a dynamic thing that God alone can do. The breath of life and the breath of eternal life belong to God. And so we have this put forward in John's gospel. Now, John wrote the gospel for this purpose. John 20, verse 31, gospel of John. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So I've told you the story of Jesus so that you would believe in him. Amen? Believe, amen, there's the gospel, believe it. But he wrote the epistle of 1 John according to his own words in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. The very reason I wrote the gospel to you, I hope you've done that. But he goes on to say this, that you may know you have eternal life. You see, you can believe in your own energy, in your own strength, and never be truly born again. But where the Spirit of God enters in and brings new life, there's always evidence of new life. So how does one know if one has been breathed into by the Spirit of God? Has this new life imparted to them? That's why he wrote 1 John. So do me a favor, take uh, two fingers and put them right there on your arm and see if you can find a pulse, please. I happen to find mine. If you cannot find yours, please try this with me. If you, okay, you can put it on the side of your neck too. If you cannot find yours, please raise your hand and we will do our best to come alongside you quickly and help you out. So we know we're alive physically because we get a pulse, right? The heart's beating, the brain waves are firing, uh, we're sitting upright right now. Okay, so physical life is, is kind of revealed in that manner. What I'd like for us to do is to kind of place our fingers on our spiritual life and see if we can find a pulse there. What does it look like to have this new life in us, a work of the Holy Spirit imparting to us a new life? Well, according to John, here we go. It is a new and growing life. And if you have your Bibles, join me in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. So it is a new and growing life with an attitude of obedience toward the word of God. How do I know if I have a pulse spiritually speaking? How do I know the spirit of God has imparted to me new life? Number one is that we now have an attitude of obedience toward the word of God. So notice with me, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. And by this we, what's your Bible say? No. no, yes, that's the key word. In the book of 1 John, K-N-O-W, to know. It is used 45 times in these five chapters. He says, and by this we know that we have come to know him. 
Oh, John, do tell. If we keep his commandments. In other words, the word of God now becomes precious to us in this new life. Peter tells us it's, it's milk. How do you know a baby has life? How do you know a newborn has life? They're hungry. Feed me, feed me, crying, screaming, feed me, feed me milk. Peter says the word of God is milk to our new life. We desire it. We want it. We need it. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4 that it's bread. It's the bread of the soul. It's more necessary than even physical food. So James is telling us that, or John is telling us that one of the key ways that we know that we have experienced new life, new birth, is that we now have this attitude of obedience towards the word of God. Our desire is for it. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a what? Are we following along here? Yeah. James, can you be more frank, please? Or, sorry, John, can you be more clear, please? Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Now, the word keeps there is key. It's a key word. It literally means to keep the stars. It's a nautical term for people who would sail in the Mediterranean. They would set their course according to the stars, and that would be the way in which they made their way forward. Now, a a gale can come up and push them off course, but they will come back to be guided by the stars. And, you know, doldrums may hit and the, the boat's not moving much, but they're still being guided by those stars. That's our life. Before we were doing our own thing, living our own way, doing whatever we felt we wanted. We were living our own life. But now, the word of God is how we chart our course forward. It is seeking to obey and to honor the Lord and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can get blown off course, amen? (laughs) We can hit doldrums. But the goal is, this is how I now chart my life course going forward. This is what John tells us. If there is new life, and you want to know that you can know if you have eternal life, one of the key ways is you now have an attitude of obedience toward the word of God. You know, um, before I came to Christ, I I was just like everybody else, you know? Uh, So we had a Bible in the house. We had one Bible in our whole house growing up, and it was my mother's, and it said Margaret Ewing Small. She got it like when she was a little child. It was leather, and it was all old and corroded, and it had never been opened. But after I came to Christ, I couldn't get my hands on one quick enough. I needed to know what it said. There was a man who was baptized in the last church I was in, His name is Jared. He is now finishing up seminary, getting ready to go into ministry. But Jared said, before I can be baptized, I've got to read the whole Bible through. Well, Jared, come on, man, work on it. And he he got up and gave the testimony. There is no way I could ever stand before Jesus Christ and not have read the only book he gave us. Where does that desire come from? The new heart, the new birth. This is the hunger of a soul, the, the desire of the new heart. It is an attitude of active obedience toward the word of God. Jesus made it very clear. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's that simple. And if you don't keep the commandments of God, you don't love God. According to James, you're a liar. I'm sorry, John. (laughs) I keep James, John, Peter. I know they're all over. I got all of them up here. Hello. All right. So, so, So this is a key indicator. Just as you're getting your pulse rate, I'm I'm alive physically. We need to put our fingers on the pulse of our spirit. Do we hunger for the word? Is it what we long for? Is it what we desire? You know, this is why we put out this little reading document every year in this church. And we'll put it again in the beginning of next year. This is reading through the entire Bible in a year. It's about four chapters every morning. But we put this out to give you a menu so you can feed yourself on the word of God so your soul can grow. That's the point. And so I just want to encourage you, please assess your heart. Where are you at when it comes to the Bible? 
Where are you at when it comes to the word of God? It's a huge barometer as to our spiritual condition. So there's number one, a new and growing attitude of obedience toward the word of God. Number two, and this is over in 1 John chapter 3. He says that we will now have an affection for the people of God. We will have an affection for the people of God. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. Notice what he says. We know, there's our key word. How can you know that you have eternal life? One, of, one way is that we have an attitude of obedience towards the word of God. Another way we can know. We know that we have passed from death to life. How? Please tell me. Because we love the brothers. In the word brothers, it's referring to the church. We love the church. Whoever does not love abides in death. And everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know, there's our key word, that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Go over to chapter 4 and verse 7. This continues this thought. Uh, in many ways, John is like a string of pearls. They kind of connect together as you read through it. Chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Notice, and whoever loves has been born of God, and there's our key word, knows God. But verse 8. Anyone who does, anyone who does not love, what? Does not know God. He couldn't be any plainer here. Go over to chapter 5 and verse 1. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Do you see what he's saying? That if there has been this impartation of new life in you, not only will you hunger for the word, desire it, and seek to live in a way that pleases Jesus Christ, but you're also going to long for the people of God. There's an old saying, um, birds of a feather. That's right. We're in the mating season right now. And you see all these birds pairing off to have their little ones together. And you hardly ever see a crow with a seagull. Amen? So, so you know, you see a, a blackbird with a blackbird. You see a red-winged blackbird with a red-winged blackbird. It's funny how they find each other like that. You see Mr. Mallet with, with Mrs. Duck. And, and you, you see all of these birds looking to hang out with their own kind. Well, when you become born again and you become a child of God, you now want to hang out with the children of God. It's that simple. That hunger, that desire, the longing to connect with one another should be a reality. So it was this that got under my skin so bad when I first came to Christ. So I came to Christ when I was 21. Five years I was in agoraphobia and I had isolated myself to the bedroom in the farmhouse in South Paris. And I get saved. Praise God. And I start reading the Bible, and I start reading these verses in 1 John. And what it's saying to me is, God's saying to me, Billy, you got to go to church. Oh, well, Lord, I don't think I have to go to church. I have all these issues. No, Billy, you have to go to church. No, Lord, this isn't talking about me. It's about everybody else, But because I'm an exception. I've got all these issues like agoraphobia, panic attacks. You can't expect this of me. Bill, go to church. God wouldn't let up on it, because this is what it means to be truly saved. It is to connect, consistently connect with the people of God. And by the way, going to church that first Sunday, not only did I meet my wife that first Sunday, who would be my future wife, but it was the help of the people of God that enabled me to overcome my agoraphobia. It's amazing how God does these things. Obedience brings its own blessing. And, and so we have this, this idea that, that you know, um, I don't need the church. I bumped into so many people. I used to do that. I used to go to church. And it's like, well, why not anymore? Because I don't need it. Here's a thought, just a thought. What if going to church wasn't about you? What if it was about obedience before God? And what if it's about being here for the needs of others? 
Now, all of a sudden, it's not just about you, though God blesses us as well in obedience in that process. But I have met too many, quote unquote, older saints who are done with the church, and they just kind of hang out at home, and, and oh, I can't go to church because, you know, I have panic attacks, or I'm not comfortable there, but they can go to Walmart, amen? They can go to restaurants. They can do many different things, but what they can't do is obey God when it comes to getting together with the people of God. You know, it's my conviction, it's a growing conviction, and I could be wrong, and I'll be the first to admit that Bill Walker can be wrong. And all God's people said, yeah, amen, amen. But more and more, this is becoming my conviction about people who can just dust off the bride of Christ and consider it no big deal. If the Holy Spirit dwells in a person, you can't just dust off the bride of Christ. This is the point. This is the point that James or John is bringing forward. 1 John 2.19, this is probably more of what's really happening. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have, and here's the key phrase, continued with us. Dear ones, what Christ has started in a heart will endure till he either takes you home or comes back for you. True biblical faith perseveres. It doesn't just say, eh, not anymore. So the point here of continuing is a biblical truth of true faith. It perseveres to the very end. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. This is a growing conviction. They did church for years and they dusted it off. They now say, I believe in Jesus, but there's no obedience to the commands of scripture. My heart is concerned for people who would say that. Because according to this, how do, you, how do you talk about something that is, that is real and, and it's there and it's innate and it, it's, it's, a, it's a new desire and a heart and a longing. It, it, it's as if something new is in you. It's, it's as if you're not doing it just by yourself, but you're being impelled by somebody in you to do what God wants to please him. Does this make any sense? I've looked back on my Christian walk a thousand times. I could have walked off it was, if it was just about me. So many times, but it's never been just about me. There's been somebody within me, the Holy Spirit, that just won't let me go. Amen? This inner witness of the Holy Spirit is a necessary work in those who claim to have true faith. So to say, eh, not for me, is making a huge admission. A huge admission, sadly speaking. So, <laughs> checking the pulse. How's the pulse doing? Do I have an attitude of obedience towards the word of God? Do I have an affection for the people of God? It should be new and it should be growing. It should be growing if it's of the Lord. And then thirdly, is there the awareness of the indwelling spirit of God? So 1 John chapter 4 and verse 13 says this, by this we, what's the word? No, here's our key word. How do you know that you have eternal life? Well, you now have a new attitude of obedience towards the word of God. You have an affection for the people of God. And now you know that you abide in him and he in you because he has given us of his spirit. Capital S, the Holy Spirit. And if you trail back just a little bit to chapter uh, 3 and verse uh, 24, it says this. By this and by this we know that he abides in us by the capital S spirit whom he has given us. So the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is an important truth for the child of God, the true child of God, this new life that the Holy Spirit has birthed in us. Again, Paul said this in Romans 8, verses 8 and 9. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, who, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact 
the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's a powerful statement. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, Paul says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. And we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How does he do that? How does he do that? Let me just give you a couple quick ways. So, before I knew the Lord, I did stuff. I did a lot of stuff. I lived just like everybody else. I did things that were not good for me and did not end well for me. But I never had a conscience about them. I never had any qualms that what I was doing was somehow okay because everybody else was doing it. And so no issues. I didn't like the consequences, but no issues. I just was doing it. When I got saved, the Spirit of God entered into me, and he's affectionately known as what kind of spirit? The Spirit. Yeah, now there is a Holy Spirit who lives in me. And what I used to do, I would try to do, and now I had qualms. I had, like, guilt. I was feeling shame. Where did that even come from? From the Holy Spirit, who now dwells in me. And my flesh was lusting against the Spirit, and the Spirit was now challenging my flesh, and I was a mess. In some ways, I felt worse after I met Jesus than before I met Jesus. If you know what I'm saying, I never used to wrestle with that stuff. And then it was an all out war inside of me. That's the Holy Spirit inside the child of God, calling them to walk in a way that honors God. So one of the ways the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's child is the reality of his presence when it deals with the issue of lust and, and, and sin and, and now guilt and shame. Those are real things before God. So not only the conviction of sin, but also revealing the truths of the word of God. That's one of the key indicators that the Holy Spirit's present. Uh, so my mother, um, who lives over here on Buckley Street in Lewiston, who just gave her testimony in the women's group on Thursday, uh, she went forward in a church service at South Pierce Baptist Church. She got saved with an evangelist who came up from Jacksonville, Florida. And so I was away at Bible school, and I got a call late at night one night from the pastor of the church, Derek Bartlett. Hey, Bill, thought you'd just like to know your mother gave her heart and life to Jesus Christ tonight. And I'm like, Yeah! And yet there was hesitation. Okay, I pray that this is true and real. And a few weeks later, I was talking with my mother on the phone. We engaged her immediately thereafter and said, praise God. But she said this to me. She said, William, that's what she calls me, William. She said, the Bible's now making sense to me. The moment she said that, it was boom. Thank you, God. Because that's an evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He wrote the word of God. He illumines the word of God to the child of God. So, so these are the indicators of the awareness of the indwelling spirit of God. So, so how do I know if I got this thing called eternal life? I believe in Jesus. Let me ask you, do you have a new and growing attitude of obedience towards the word of God? Do you have an affection for the people of God? Do you have this awareness of the indwelling spirit of God? And then lastly, do you have an abiding, are you abiding in trust in the Son of God? This brings us to chapter 5 and verse 4 and in verse uh, 13. So notice what it says, uh, 1 John chapter 5 verse 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, our faith. Now, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. That little word believe is what is called a present active participle. In other words, it's not talking about a past act of I walked an aisle or I bent a knee or I got baptized. 
It's talking about a present reality in your life. I believe in the Son of God. I love him and I am following him in obedience. That's the reality of someone who is truly born again. And so there is this ongoing reality of not just justification. Faith has to start somewhere. But the necessary and important issue of sanctification. Do you know and love Jesus Christ today? Can I just say that apart from these being true in a life, there is no assurance of salvation. We're quick to pat people on the back and say, good to go, see you in heaven. But unless these things are a reality and growing in a life, and by the way, they will endure throughout the remainder of the life of the true believer in one degree or another, there is no assurance of salvation. That's what James wrote, First John, or <laughs> that's what John wrote, First John 4, to back up the gospel of John to show us the reality of the indwelling spirit of God. And so, uh, in closing, and boys, it's time, eh? In closing, how's your spiritual pulse? How's your spiritual pulse? Is it strong? Is it evident? I hope so. Oh, I hope so. If it is, praise God. But can I just say, don't rest on your laurels. <laughs> don't say, yay, I, I'm there. Well, good. It's a race. Keep running. <laughs> Forget what's behind. Keep moving forward. Reach for the prize of the upward call of God. Dear ones, pursue him, finish well. If it's strong and evident, praise God. Is it weak or shallow? Repent, repent. Confess any known sin and ask God to help you to walk in the graces that he has given you to grow in Christ Jesus. Oh, dear ones. This life is so short. Don't imp into heaven. Hear well done, my good and faithful servant. Strong and evident, praise God. Weak or shallow, repent. Not present. Not present. Repent. Believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bend your knee and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, get up and follow him with the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the example of Abraham. You called him out of the Ur of Chaldees all by grace. You called him into a covenant with you all by grace. You promised him the son that would become ultimately the heir of all promises and ultimately Jesus Christ. You called him to offer that son up. To give back to God the son of promise and he believed that you would raise him from the dead what faith what faith so he not only shows us justifying faith he believed God but he went on to live a life of deep deep obedience and love for the living God Oh, Father, may that mark our lives. All of us are, are weak at our best. We're failing. But I pray even today that you would use the words put in front of us to challenge us to get up and to follow Jesus Christ with all our hearts. Hear our prayers, our Father, please, and honor them. Help us to walk with Christ, I pray. In his name. And God's people said, 